Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct pleasure and honor to address this esteemed audience at this important commemoration. I deeply regret not being with you in person to celebrate this milestone and to contribute to the ongoing rich discussions with a view to identify lasting solutions to address the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence in conflict. I hope that nonetheless you accept my warmest greetings from The Hague, along with my sincere gratitude to Special Representative Pramila Patton and other co-organizers for putting together this seminal event. Allow me at the outset to express my personal admiration and respect for SRSG Patton, her predecessors, some of whom are present here today, and of course, the hardworking staff of her office, and indeed, the many champions at the forefront of this common struggle, participating at this event and beyond, for their crucial work around the globe. I consider the UN mandate on sexual violence in conflict a key cornerstone of the global structure and response to sexual violence in conflict. And along with my office, we feel privileged to consider SRSG Patton and her office a natural partner in the advancement of her joint goals of curbing the scourge of these appalling crimes. As prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, I regularly witness the devastating consequences of sexual and gender-based crimes on victims and affected communities. In the courage and dignity of victims and survivors, I have seen human nature at its best. And in the sheer brutality of crimes against them, I have seen it at its very worst. Sexual and gender-based violence is sadly characteristics of so many conflicts. It is too often perpetrated as a deliberate weapon of war or repression against women, men, girls, and boys. It is used despicably in the machination of ethnic cleansing. This must stop. But we must be realistic. No one single person, no one single entity, no one institution, and no one country can hope to achieve real success and progress alone. And this is my key message today, a call for collective action, all in our respective capacities, in a coordinated and complementary fashion to counter the horror of sexual and gender-based crimes. I want to take this opportunity to salute the courageous survivors present at the conference who have shared with us their harrowing stories. Despite their ordeals, they have shown profound inner strength, their sheer resolve to be heard, to move forward, gives us all inspiration. It is my firm belief that justice has a vital role to play in both deterring and punishing sexual and gender-based crimes in times of conflict. Sexual and gender-based crimes are explicitly and extensively proscribed in the founding treaty of the International Criminal Court the Rome Statute. Upon taking office as ICC prosecutor, one of my primary goals was to ensure that the protection of the law is employed to the fullest extent, to foster a culture of accountability where sexual violence is no longer tolerated without consequence. We still have much work to do towards this aim. In 2014, I launched a comprehensive policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes. The policy guides my office's investigations and prosecutions of these crimes. I have made our work in this area a strategic priority. And this policy is being implemented in all relevant aspects of my office's work. In many of the situations of which we are seized, from Myanmar in the context of the alleged deportation of the Rohingya to Guinea, Nigeria, and Ukraine, or in our formal investigations in the Central African Republic or the Democratic Republic of Congo, to name only a few, we are confronted with the perversiveness of sexual and gender-based crimes. We try to gather the necessary evidence to build cases that are reflective of the nature of these crimes 
with a view to holding the perpetrators to account. In July of this year, for instance, trial judges of the ICC unanimously convicted Mr. Boscon Taganda on all charges my office brought against him, including rape and sexual slavery committed against child soldiers within his own armed group in the DRC. In doing so, the ICC pushed the envelope of the law to bring added protection to children from the plight of sexual violence. Ensuring such tangible results in court is my office's job and main contribution. It is nevertheless not an easy task. Challenges can come in different forms, however, but they will not and should not deter us from doing what is necessary. For me and my office, survivor stories, each and every word, strengthen our resolve to fight against impunity, no matter how formidable the challenges or how powerful the perpetrators. The ICC is, of course, not a panacea. The investigation and prosecution of these crimes, at the national level in particular, is crucial. My office stands ready to assist and continue to collaborate with national jurisdictions and international actors to incentivize such work at the national level in a complementary fashion. Specific and concrete collaboration has notably taken place on a regular basis between my office and the Office of the Special Representative. This includes the UN team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence in conflict. This collaboration has aimed to encourage national investigation and prosecution of alleged sexual crimes, notably in Guinea and Nigeria. But civil society and non-governmental organizations also play a critical, multifaceted role from raising awareness to focusing and keeping the attention of key actors on this important issue to ensure responsibilities are met, or as first responders, to report on situations on the ground and to document alleged crimes where appropriate. Ours must be an age where we finally ensure that sexual and gender-based crimes will no longer be tolerated, and that we will relentlessly pursue those who tear violently at the social fabric of society through such egregious crimes. I thank you for your attention.